Live once again, Spotlight Over the City. I'm your host, Stan Long, along with the lovely, lovely super host, Dana Dane. <laughs> hey, hey, and hey. And guess who else? We found Miss Lyric Hawkins as well. Lyric Welcome back to the show, here. Lyric. What's going on, gang? What's going on, babe? Nothing I much. miss y'all. You don't miss That's nobody. You well, 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 okay, so how you miss us, but you always running around and don't let us go on none of the, the trips you take. Exactly. You all in Cali and this and that. What? Well... You know. Yeah, I called her. She was like, um, I said, so uh, are you going to be here our first day at the new studio? She said, oh, I'm in California. I said, excuse me. Okay. I was on the right. beach. Laguna but, Beach. Rock star. <laughs> Laguna Beach. But. I saw the water almost uh, drenched that ass, too. Oh, my God. I had to run on camera on Facebook Live. <laughs> oh, I, I missed that. I was about that. to get washed away, Dana. Yeah, and it I was can't funny. swim. So, yeah. Right. But so I'm loving this. Laguna Beach. What's going on in Laguna Beach I'm that loving we missed this. Well, actually, I went to a training because, you know, I have a media and personal brand. And, um, development company and I'm a firm believer in mastering your craft That's right. because there's so many people out here that help others say they're a coach and they train but they haven't took any classes so how are you going to teach somebody and you haven't mastered you know what you do that's right so I'm a firm believer in educating yourself. So I was just out there getting some more knowledge. Know, so you saw on your craft, learning. you go all the way to California to get some, some classes. I like that. Well, I, only the best, right? Because I got to right. deliver the best. I can't give you halfway. So, right. you know. What's up, Dana? Do do. Go big or go home. That's what I always say. Yeah, what's what's up, going Dana? on, Miss? What you got going on? Um, everything. Guys running around the city <laughs> going crazy. <laughs> Dana got <laughs> everything. Yeah, this girl right I here, got... every time I look, it's something going on. Oh, we got this going on. Hey, Stan, I got this going on. I said, so how you going to do all this? <laughs> I manage. I don't know how I do it. Through the grace of God, he gives me energy that I don't... I, don't, it, I know it can only come got, from God. I want that juice. Yeah, it can only come from God. <laughs> and I'm so serious. So it has to be God because last year, even when I was sick, I was sick. I went from a size seven to a size one. So that shows how small I got when I was sick. Do you know the entire time I was sick, I did not stop working. I would still get dressed, do my makeup, go oh, out, yeah. host events. God has given me some energy that I can't even explain, but all I can do is say, thank you, Lord. Is he not thank amazing? I amazing, really. What it about you, really Mr. S. Dot Long? Mr. S. Dot Long on his grind as usual, running around like crazy. I was here, to tell us what, what's going on. I got, a, I got something I'm going to reveal to y'all that nobody in the, in the building knows. Oh. oh. Mm -hmm. But us, before I, us, before I reveal that, yeah, I want to uh, shout out know. to Mark Nichols, our guest today. We have yes. an amazing guest coming up. Author Mark Nichols has an amazing book out. You're looking at it right now. Uh, the Nichols Brothers, Suburbia to Destruction. Mm. Right, it's gonna be an awesome. It's gonna interview. be an amazing interview. Um, before we even get into the interview, I want to put this disclaimer out there because I got a lot of flack. Um, I'm, I'm gonna do it anyway because I had a purpose for this show, but I got a lot of flack for the show because a lot of people was like, "Well, why would you have that person on?" and blah 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 blah. And his brother did this and that and the third. Well, we we're not here to glorify anything that's a heinous crime. So before I before I get into the show, I want to know let people know that that's not the reason for the show or the book. He didn't write the book to glorify the crime right. of his brother, and he definitely not on the show to glorify anything. So we do send our condolences once again to all the fallen officers and everybody else who lost their life in this situation. That's right. So before we get into it, I had to clear that up because I got a lot of what's and why's and who's. And so Spotlight Over the City does what they do. We spotlight it anyway because that's <laughs> what we, we do. do. So right. back and, to and this regular schedule program. people just need to know <laughs> what the media the might not tell you exactly. or what exactly. you heard. So let's, let's hear from the mm -hmm. horse's mouth, who, somebody who was right there that can tell you the real. Right. So like for the Clown of the Day Award. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I feel the Clown of the Day Award goes to this dude, uh, uh, the president of Bethune-Cookman. You the idiot. And the reason I'm saying that is because why would you have this goofball come on as a, a, a keynote speaker knowing that the whole university was booing her before she got there? And then you turn around and say, well, if y'all keep booing, you're going to mail your diplomas. 
Well, you would have mailed my diploma because I promise you, the, the, I would have booed your ass. That's why you said exactly. that. Boo you too. Boo, boo, President of Bethune Cookman, because yeah, you should have you people that come that? in there that have the community in mind and not just have your politics in mind. You That's have to right. start. And so this is what we're gonna be doing on Spotlight of the City. We're gonna undress you. Yeah. So just understand. We're gonna be that. honest. We're gonna speak <laughs> exactly. from the heart. We're not gonna say what we think the people want to hear. We're gonna say what we feel is going on, and everybody's entitled to their opinion, mm-hmm. and people are enti- entitled to not agree. That's life. That's exactly right. Yeah, so save your hate mail because I don't read it. I mean, everybody out here has family, extended family. We can't be held accountable for everything my third cousin did, my fifth cousin right. down the line. <laughs> like, that's not my exactly story. Right. But exactly. I can give you the real because I was there. Right, exactly. And, that, and that's where the difference is. And then the assumptions are all out the door. You know, because look, if it was Jeffrey Dahmer or some other, they have documentaries, all types of, you know, mainstream exactly. TV. Mm-hmm. As soon so, as yeah. we come mm-hmm. in the community and try to do something, you know. It's a big, it's a big deal. It's yeah, a big deal. But, but, like, but, but we a big deal, though. Anyway. But we, we spotlight on the city, we so, we, on so city. we do what we want to do. You feel me? And so we don't need no permission. Yeah, so we don't need no excuse permission. Excuse me for being bad boys, but we don't need your permission to have a show. And this is what we decided to do. <laughs> and and so it. I think that if you stay tuned, some of the questions that come about will show you that this show had a purpose. It's just yeah. not a show that yeah. we did just because. So on that note, you guys, it's time for a segment of Did You Know? And I do have a something that I thought was amusing before we go on. But I got to okay. switch my glasses because, you know, these are not really reading glasses. So let me, you let know me just, what? Let me do this. Let me do this right here so I can read because I can't see a well, damn thing. Okay. <laughs> all, right, all right. So <laughs> on to the segment of Did You Know? This is interesting to me because I thought it was funny, actually. Did you know that the Long Ranger was black? Who told you that? <laughs> it's a black fact. The Long Ranger, his name is Bass Reeves. And Reeves was born a slave but escaped and was during the Civil War where he lived in, in what was uh, known as Indian Territory. And before I go on, you should have known this was a black man because he named his horse Tano. I mean, um, he named his horse Kimasabi. Like, that's, you know, that's not going to be... So, so what we see on TV, the Long Ranger... So they made him a, white. Well, everything's been saying? whitewashed. A lot of things been whitewashed. For instance, how could Tarzan be white? So what he makes swing you? through the jungle, say, oh. Well, white man can't swing through the jungle. How right. he get in the jungle and know how to talk to the animals? I'm just trying to understand. Only black people. Why could couldn't talk? he be white though and do that? They ain't Doctor Doolittle. Are you right. saying? <laughs> so, so, so what you telling me that? So what you trying to tell me is that this man was over in the jungle of Africa talking to the animals and he was white. So what you telling me is a white man can't go in the jungle and talk to the animals? Yeah, but he gonna need assistance. Okay, well maybe he Ooh, might. He's gonna need some assistance to get. He, he can't. He can't be from Africa, first of all, and 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 in that native land, swinging in the jungle, talking to animals. You had to have experience with that. We gonna get into that later though, because we gonna get back it. to Mr. Reeves. Go back to the did you know? <laughs> I'm trying to tell you some facts. Mr. Mr. Reeves was born a slave, but escaped to the west to the west during the Civil War, where he lived in what was known as Indian Territory. He eventually became a deputy U.S. marshal and was a master of disguise, an expert marksman, mm. and had a Native uh, American companion. And so he rode on a silver horse. His story was not unique, however. One of four cowboys was black, despite the stories told in popular movies and films and books i'm sorry wow. so did that is you know? that is did the you know ranger. did you know the lone ranger uh was a brother and i'm not knocking any race don't don't get me wrong well, we know just that. because i'm pro black don't mean i'm not for any other race i'm just right. for my race as well so we gotcha. do have an amazing show today you guys yes, we have yes, an amazing yes. guest coming up but before we do that we're gonna that's right mm-hmm. his I name, and him, new every week from I'm you trying. Keep, well, we keep got and then you real <laughs> smart <laughs> Well, you now I got a team. I got, I got a team. I don't smart. be knowing what I'm talking about. I got a team. They help me out. I'm just trying to tell you. Make me look good. <laughs> no, but I'm into history. I'm into facts. And I do believe that we have to educate our people, not that everybody else, again, don't need educate. Oh, I could take these off. Hold on. Not, not that everybody well, else don't need educate. But, but, but hold up. Not that they hey, don't need educating, but you just do just have to color. educate our people because we've been miseducated. Yeah, no, I and agree And so with we've that. Been, we have a big understanding, but we have to overstand. And so mm-hmm. this is why I'm here doing this show. I needed a platform to do such a thing. And before I go any further, is God not good, though? All yes, the time. Is. When I say amazing, we have a talk show. How about that? Yes. 
Jesus. And we all over the place. We in Europe. We wherever. You can spotlight we're on the everywhere. city live and we popping, right? Yeah. yeah. Is that oh, not amazing? I love our new home. I swear I do. Man, I love it. Shout out to Listen Vision, man. When I tell That's you the right. studio's popping, we popping here. Producer. We got a mm-hmm. shout out to Jacob, our producer. And he That's keeps right. us hot, too, though. We don't yeah. even have to talk to Jacob too much. We just come in and nod and Jacob be like, let's we do to, it. He has to <laughs> tell, us, tell us, come on, you're talking to me. Right, right, right. right. Jacob, <laughs> Jacob keep us straight. Like, we've let's been in here for years, right? But um, he frame us in and he get us right every time. We feel yep. comfortable doing the show. It's a it's a pleasure working with you, Jacob. Smooth sailing. Um, we thank God we for the it. studio. We can get yes. to see what we're doing in here, and it's a good feeling. So thank God for the opportunity, mm-hmm. and we're going to take full advantage of it. Amen. So, gotcha. so you guys want to talk about anything else before we pull our guests on? Because um, we got a full pack show. Yeah, well, well, no. Go ahead. Make sure you like our page too, Spotlight yeah. Over the City. Make sure you go to Facebook and like our page, you guys, and be a part oh, yeah, of Spotlight definitely. Over the City. Definitely Spotlight Over the City. But you know, actually, I just came from uh, T Mobile down in uh, Northeast Washington, the rapper designer, okay. Panda Panda. Panda. panda, 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 panda. Okay. Hi, go, panda, panda. Oh, I don't know. That's close enough. Dana, you know. Panda, panda, what is that? <gasps> I got bras in Atlanta. I got bras oh, in Atlanta. Oh, that song. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's, that's, oh, his name is Designer. His name is... <laughs> oh, yo, I'm lost. How old are you, Dana? I'm 25. 24. Really? Mm. You got bras in Atlanta. Mm. But no, look. <laughs> I'm going to answer. Let me shut Credit up. Credit cards <laughs> the scanner, yeah. Hey, y'all cutting up. Buddy's going to be at the 930 Club tonight, so... Uh, Okay. Shout out to the designer. And shout out to Antonio um, down there at T-Mobile, too. Oh, yeah, definitely that. So we're going to be behind the scenes. I'm going to give you all a little Facebook Live and bring you all real time. But that's what we do on right. Spotlight Over Spotlight the City. Spotlight Over the City, baby. Thanks for all y'all tuning in, too. We definitely appreciate y'all tuning in and watching our show. And the call-in, mm-hmm. we great, uh, have a, the call-in number is 240-621-0077. And um, after this commercial, you'll be able to call in, and um, we'll have you plug right in. Yeah. So, again, thanks to all of the audience for uh, watching us, and we have a wonderful show today. So we'll go to a commercial. We'll let you see a little glimpse of the artist. I'm sorry, the author that's coming up, and he'll be right up right after this commercial. Spotlight over the Spotlight city. Over Don't the go city. anywhere. Spotlight. The Fulton County Courthouse Killer is opening up to us, Channel 2 Action News, 11 years after that deadly rampage. Brian Nichols says he has stayed quiet because he didn't want to cause more damage than he already has. It was March 2005 when Nichols escaped from the Fulton County Courthouse that touch off chaos in the streets and a massive manhunt. Nichols killed four people, including a judge. He's now breaking his silence in an exclusive interview with Channel 2's investigative reporter Mark Winnie. And Mark joins us now live inside the courthouse. This is where the murderous rampage started. Mark? That's right. The killings that began in this courtroom, what was then Judge Roland Barnes' courtroom, gripped the nation. And this interview with Brian Nichols offers us the opportunity to look into the mindset of one of the most notorious active shooters in America, the most notorious in Georgia's history. The calls came from the courthouse shooter, Brian Nichols. I did some, some very bad things. His victims in March 2005, Judge Roland Barnes, court reporter Julie Brandau, Deputy Hoyt Teasley, federal agent David Wilhelm. Doing an interview with you, there will be nothing that I want from that, really, other than to express my remorse for the things that I've done. To stay inside prison rules, a friend of Nichols, who says she's the only non-family member on his small approved call list, relayed our questions with her phone on speaker on several calls. Have you sought redemption? Have you asked God for forgiveness? Have you asked God for forgiveness? I have. I have. I pray and I ask for forgiveness. The subject matter, wide-ranging. Would you ask him, were you too wrapped up in yourself, in your selfish needs, in the time leading up to the killings, and during the killings. I think I was delusional. I think that drugs and alcohol played a part in those delusions. If there is something that um, someone could take away from, from this talk, it will be to recognize and understand the harm that marijuana can do. Was justice done to Brian Nichols? You know, it doesn't matter. Things are as they are. If I could go back and, and do things differently, of course I would. I can't play the hand that I wish I was dealt. You know, I have to, to play the hand that I had. Now, there is much, much more that we talked to Brian Nichols about. Was there almost a fifth murder victim? 
more about the role he says marijuana played. And is he sorry for himself or his victims? That and more coming up on Channel 2 Action News at 6. Now, Mark, of course, we all know interviews like this don't just happen overnight. I mean, it's been 11 years since this happened, but can you give us some insight into how you were able to set up this interview with Brian Nichols? Yeah, this may be the hardest one to land uh, I, I, I've ever landed. Uh, it started months ago, uh, negotiating first to try to get a camera into the prison. Uh, corrections officials indicated they had security concerns. Then we went about uh, trying to arrange this phone arrangement. We edited out uh, most of the uh, sound, of course, from the intermediary. But uh, even that, I had to convince Nichols to do the interview. Yep. And he did. All right, Mark, thank you. More at 6. Mark Winnie live at the Fulton County Courthouse. Thank you. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, we are back, Spotlight Over the City, and guess yes. what? We added a plus one with our guest today is, uh, is Mark Nichols. Welcome to the uh, party, Mark. Thank you, thank you. I'm glad to be here. Oh, he done put his, he done put his damn, put the, he done put the damn uh, radio over. Oh, thank you. Right. Glad to be here. <laughs> what the hell? You oh, trying to upstage no, me? You know, no, no, no. You <laughs> know, it sounds better than yours, Dad. Wait a minute. You know, wait a, a minute. I'm a DJ. You know, I'm a DJ, so, you know, I got to have the microphone voice. Okay, before we go any further, do your DJ. Get, give us a, one of them quick DJ voices real quick, like we in a club real quick. Break it down. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Get on up off them pot, some cheers. Party for me. He's the second guest with that voice. <laughs> Who was the other one? Oh, Micheline oh, was, was the, the other one with yeah, the radio voice. Yeah, with the, with voice. the radio yeah. voice, right? Oh, wow, that's hot. Well, I don't have that, so look, don't look for me to get you know Barry White up in here. You can do it, Stan. You can do it. So anyway, welcome back to Spotlight of the City in all seriousness. We have our guest here, Mark Nichols, who wrote a book. He's an author. You're looking at his book today, you guys. And um, this this I read some of your, Mark. You, man, I've been laughing at you for about two days. <laughs> I've read the book. Right. I didn't finish reading the book, but some of the stories that's in this book we're going to talk about. All right. And I'm starting to believe that it's in the water. It might be in the water. I, I really believe is. that, you know, somebody might need to really check their water out. And the reason I say that is when we get into the book a little bit, you guys will see the story um, based on the, the, the thing he said by being in the water. A lot of people from Mark's neighborhood um, ended up in, a, in some serious, you know, situations, crime-wise, uh, murdered. All kind of stuff. And so it came from this one block. And by the way, I have family that grew up on 33rd, right across okay. Memorial Stadium. So that's part of y'all beef. <laughs> yeah, it <laughs> is. You yeah, telling me yeah. in the when book, y'all was running street. from 33rd yeah, and ducking. Yeah. And those, <laughs> my cousin lived on 33rd, actually still does to this day. Um, so um, I'm familiar with the area. Yeah, you know, we had some problems with them boys up there, but it all worked out in the end. Nobody yeah. died, you know. <laughs> so let's get into it. Who is Mark Nichols? Well, you know, I'm a barber, man. You know, I was really don't want to be here because I'd rather have my brother back, and you know, but I had to write this story. But, you know, I'm just a barber, man, and decided that I, I need to tell the story because there's nobody else that can tell it like I can tell it. You know, mm -hmm. Ashley right. Smith, she had her seven hours with them, and she made a movie and a book and renamed the book after the movie and started selling it again. So I'm, I'm giving you... 40-something years, 40, 50 years for Brian, 45 years for Brian. And you are the older brother. I mean, I am the older brother, so yeah. that was your youngest brother. It didn't look, when I saw him, because of his statue, your brother's a big man. Like, oh. he was about six, what, six, six four? One, six, six two. two. But, you know, you wouldn't even think that we were brothers if we were standing next to each other, you know. I'm I'm height challenged. He's, <laughs> you know, height I'm challenge. height challenged. You know, he's bench pressing like 400 pounds, black belt and karate, you know. Wow. So what made you want to write this book? Well, you know, um, I talked to Brian about it, and he said, you know, Ashley's making all this money. You know, somebody else, our family needs to go ahead and say something. So right. I decided, you know, to go ahead and do it. It's taken me seven years, but it's, it's the way it's coming out, it's come out and the um, how it's being accepted has been, like, phenomenal. I, I really can't believe it. You know, I got people telling me that, you know, they've never read, read a book like this in their life. And I'm mm -hmm. like, you know, this is the first time I ever wrote something. So, you know, for me to get compliments like that is, is, is just amazing. Let me ask you a question. Who is Ashley, for those watching that don't know? Ashley Smith is the woman that, it was a movie called Captive that came out, and she was the one that Brian had hostage for seven hours. And they just did a movie off of the seven hours that they were together. Okay, okay. yeah, Captive, yeah. the movie Captive. Mm -hmm. Right. Yes, right, because uh, what's it, Ayello. Ayello. David Owl Yellow yeah, and Owl Kate Yellow. Marie. 
played it. And yeah, that was a big thing. They was on Oprah the whole cast. Yeah, so Oprah, Oprah and Oprah and Ashley are really good friends. Really? Yeah. Wow. After oh, so the, it was on the, the own situation. network. It, no, network? it came out on Paramount Pictures released the movie. Oh, okay. You know, so it was a big movie. It was, oh, okay. you know, Paramount. Yeah. So let me ask you this: Is so is that movie based off of Ashley's interpretation of what happened? Yeah, because she couldn't get Brian's. You know, it's just all Ashley. Right. But you know, I can't. Her movie was good. So was you know, it true to was it kind of yeah, true, true to, to the form. story to the right? Yeah, I even learned something because I had kind of went hard on Ashley in my book. And after I saw the movie, I had to go back and rearrange some things that I had said about it. You oh, know, wow. so it was a the way that movie comes comes across. It's a good fit for my book. You know, it leaves you mm-hmm. wondering what was going on be, with Brian before then. That's what I was getting ready to ask you. Yes. She can talk about what happened at that moment, but it had to be events that happened that led to that mm-hmm. moment that right. only certain people would know about. And that would have to be the people that were close to him. Right. You're right. You yep. being one of them. Yes. Yeah. You know, she claimed that um, a book that she had read to him, I think it was called Purpose Driven Life. And it yeah, went on Rick to Warren. sell yeah. millions of copies. She claimed that calmed Brian down. But when I talked to Brian, he said, you know, it didn't do anything for him. That was just for her. Wow. Right. So it kind of like calmed her. It like basically God spared her. Right. Right. Which I, is a great thing. Yeah. You know, I way. think Brian was just tired by then. You know, he mm-hmm. just won. I mean, I can't imi- imagine the rush that was going through his head when you got every police officer in the United States looking for you. Yeah. Because I was in Atlanta at that time. And when I say the city was on lock, we we was witnessing the helicopters flying everywhere. And it was all over the news. And. They was locking, you know, situations down, blo- road blocking and doing all. So it was kind of like a tough situation. And we all wondered what what made a cuz you could find yourself for a lot of people that's naysayers and and I, and I don't I, you could find yourself in this situation at any given time as a human being if you feel closed in. You could feel not to say that you could take an action to that degree, but you could find yourself in a bad situation. So what do you think it was that drove Brian to that you know situation that what, what took him over the top so yeah. to speak as, as mean, his brother he snapped he wasn't the same per- when i talked to him after it happened he wasn't the same person he said you know i was fighting a war i'm like mm-hmm. what, what are you talking about how, how are you going to fight a one-man war against them you know and he really thought he was fighting a war you know so i knew that wasn't the same person plus i had heard that he was de- deteriorating mentally as he was locked up waiting that year to, before it happened. Oh, wow. right. You know, it, it, he was on trial for rape. So he, I heard he was going down from that point on. And then it just, mm-hmm. it was an incident that happened in the jail, in the bullpen that just took him over the edge. Real quick, why don't we go to the beginning so that people watching will understand exactly. what happened? Because I think a lot of people we know, I think a lot of people watching really don't even understand what happened. Tell the people who your brother was and what event we're talking about. So on March 5th, 2000, March 11th, 2005, my brother was on trial for rape, allegedly raping his uh, girlfriend of nine years. Mm. And um, the first trial was a mistrial. And the second trial was on its way to being a mistrial because both of them got caught in lies. And before that second trial ended, Brian snapped and he killed the judge the court reporter, a sheriff that I cut his head once or twice at, in, at the underground in Atlanta. And later on that evening, he killed a customs agent at his house. And um, he, he was out for 27 hours. And when he took Ashley Smith hostage and he let her go, that's when he decided to, to give up, which I didn't think he was going to give up like that. Yeah. Wow. Were you all, you, your family, were you all in touch with him? at that moment when at the time that he had ashley no you know i was watching it on tv like everybody else hoping you know i'm thinking man it's probably going to be the day that my brother dies you know but um he didn't he gave up which really shocked me because i thought he was going to put his guns out the window and just start shooting but you know he gave up and i'm glad he did because he's here for his kids now you know he got to meet his son for the first time his son was born three of i think three days before the event happened, so he had wow. never got to meet his son. But like this past summer, he got to meet his son for, for the first time, and that was a good thing, and they had a great meeting. Right. Mark, let me ask you this. It's 2005, right? Right. Okay, you're going about your day. 
you're doing your everyday thing. It's 2005, and you happen to just see it like everybody else. What goes through your mind when you look and you say, oh, wait a minute, time out. I know that person. What's, what's that thought? that you and your family had? Because we all see stuff on the news and we don't know them. So it's like, oh man, another this or another that. But the moment you said, oh, wait one minute, I know this person. Well, actually I knew who it was before they even said his name. Oh, wow. Because uh, I was living in Florida then, in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I was cutting in a hood shop. It was on Sistrunk Avenue. And when I go in the morning, I would normally just cut the news on, you know, because your clients come in, they want to talk about different mm -hmm. things that's going on. So when I cut the news on that morning, I had seen that there was a shooting at the courthouse. I'm like, okay, um, continue to watch. And then later on, they said the person that did the shooting was a rape suspect. And I said, no. you know, yeah. that's my brother. So I made a phone call to one of his friends in Atlanta, and he told me, yeah, the FBI just left, and they put a flash grenade in here and messed up my wooden floor and I cussed him out. I mean, I don't care about your floor. I'm trying to find out what's going on with my brother. You yeah. know what I mean? But I was, I was in shock. You know, I left out the shop. I went up to a park. It was probably like 10 o'clock in the morning and I, I had to grab a beer. I went and grabbed a beer, sat in the park and just tried to Makes sense. see Understand if this, man, is this is a dream? Right. I mean, is this right. really happening? Mm -hmm. And when I came back, me being a barber, all you have to do when you're a barber, I, I'm a licensed master barber. All you have to do is go in the shop and show them your license, and you start working. You know, yeah. it's no filling out anything. But when I came back, the feds were there and asking me if I could help them figure out where he was going. I looked at them like they was crazy. They tried to offer me some money. I said, man, listen, man, mm -hmm. if my brother gets to Florida, I'm going to try to get him to Cuba, so y'all might as well bounce. You know, I don't have really nothing to say to y'all. I mean, right. what do y'all think? I mean, how would I know what he's doing? And I'm in Florida, and it's 45 minutes right. after this thing happened. Why are you here? Yeah. You know, so I was, I was just in shock, and then I had to deal with people all day. I tried to stay at work, mm -hmm. and I had to deal with people all day talking about, yeah, they're going to kill him. He's, he's good as dead, you know. Yeah, so I'm, shop talk. Yeah. Right. So I'm, I'm mad, so I have to stand right. up. Like, Look, man, that's my brother. I, I'm not trying to hear that. You know, can y'all chill out or we want, you know, it's going to be some other problems around What here. about mom? Mom, and they were in Tanzania. This is why the, the reporters were after me. I was the only, it's only four of us in our immediate family. And uh, my parents were in Tanzania. I was in Florida. So who's left me? Right. right. So I had everybody gotcha. coming at me. And, you know, I'm not, I have never had to deal with the media. So I really didn't know how to handle it. You know, you did. That really was a lot. I you mean, were, it was, yourself, I like was by said. myself, and it, I'm talking about, it was the Michael Jackson trial and another high-profile mm -hmm. trial going on at that time. And I'm talking about they had at least 15 of those satellite trucks parked in front of my apartment building, knocking on my door, walking through the, the breezeway of the apartments, you know, mm -hmm. putting cards under the door trying to get me to say something. And I ended up having to go to the Larry King show because one of them quoted me as saying that I didn't want to be known as the brother of a killer, and I never said that. So that's why I ended up going to Larry King. So if Brian Straight heard down. this, you know, he wouldn't think that we turned on him exactly. and we were right. against him. Right. And see, that's another good reason that it's always good to talk to people to know firsthand because assumptions will have the whole world screwed the media. up. And the media will yeah. have the whole world screwed the media. up. Yes, it will. Mark, another question I have for you. How did your brother get a gun in the court building? Well, I'm going to be straight up about this. Mm -hmm. They were stupid as, you know, they the, their whole thing, how they conducted their business in that, in that courtroom was dumb. You know, it's no way... This is how it happened. You got you got this little lady. She's 50 something years old, maybe 5 2 something like that. You got him her escorting Brian who is 6 something, a black belt in karate, and a couple of days before they found some shanks in his shoes. But you also have her with the keys to a gun box. And the gun box is in the same area where the inmates are walking. So if somebody takes the keys, they got the guns. Brian is smart. He took the keys, and he got the guns. Oh, so he didn't get uh, her weapon. He got he, the weapons out, out of the, the gun box. Wow. He, he got one gun there, and he got the other gun, I believe, from the immigration's officer. So he had two guns. Yeah. So he had two guns. So uh, we were led to believe, well, I was led to believe that 
from the clippings when I first heard it on the news, they were saying that he overpowered the young lady. Yeah, he took did. Her weapon. No, he didn't take her weapon. He took the keys and then he went to the gun box and got the guns. The fact that he knows where the gun box is. I mean, probably you know, everybody yeah. knew, you know. Right, I mean, they they changed a lot of their, their protocol after that. You know, a lot of people got fired, but it was just yeah. ridiculously dumb to have access to guns in right. the same area with inmates. Right, and the keys, exactly. everything and the key, right there. Right there. Yeah. You, I mean, you were asking for trouble sooner or later. So he didn't, So oh, maybe he did. Maybe you can answer this question. Did he go to court that day saying, I'm going to kill people or did it just happen did he just realize okay the keys are right here the gun right here do you all even do you even know the answer to that i don't question? i don't know the answer to that question and i probably never will unless mm -hmm. my mother feels that one day he'll be released maybe not in her lifetime but she thinks a miracle is going to happen because mm -hmm. i don't talk to brian about those kinds of things right. on the phone because right. i've heard my voice on a conversation that they played over and over in atlanta of him saying if um she's known in my book as tbcia it's an acronym for what I call the rape suspect. Mm -hmm. And he said that if he would have seen her, she would have got it too. So they played that all day in the court. I mean, on the on TV and on the radio and wow. everything. So when I go to see him, we don't even talk about anything about what happened. Right. Well, yeah, that so makes so sense. I so mean, what's done is done. Mm, I guess one of the things that I think a lot of people want to know, because I got this question a lot, what actually caused your brother to snap and so... Basically, I think what they're referring to is the situation with the young lady that you spoke about that he was engaged to. So to go from a nine-year relationship and then become engaged and then all of a sudden snap, I'm thinking something occurred um, that the public may not be aware of with well, this young lady and him. Well, you know, I can't give up all the secrets to the book, <laughs> you know, but I can say that a minister was involved in of re the reason why he snapped that you know you said a minister a like reverend a minister pastor whatever you want to call him you know he was part of mm. one of the main reasons that this whole thing started you know you can't trust everybody with everything wow. and that's what i've learned from this this situation so for wow. those people who say uh because this is the other thing that i was getting this your brother's a monster and your brother should have gotten a death penalty what do you say to a person who feels that way, preferably people who had loved ones that lost their lives right. in this situation. I'm really not going to say nothing because I, I have a bad temper. And, you know, I'm probably going to end up being in an altercation with that person. You know, even though I understand that if it was one of the relatives, on this, I would understand what they're going through. But I'm not going to engage in that because it's going to get ugly in the end. Mm. You know, Right. So, you know, you have to understand that these people will have those feelings because... Right rightfully so based on the situation right. and then at the flip side we do understand that it's other lives is lost as far as your brother he's lost his life to the penitentiary no fault of no one else's of course he made a, a ill decision but he also has put you guys in the penitentiary with him because mm -hmm. family goes to penitentiary with yeah. the with the victim right. or with the person exactly. so you guys you know how how grave has this been for you guys as far as mm -hmm. a family i mean for years after this, I really was in seclusion. I really didn't want to talk to too many people. You know, it's when when a trial like that happened, I mean, it's really not anybody you can talk to that's been in that situation. Right. You know, you somebody that you can confide in that can kind of guide you. It's really not. So what I found out is that when you're on trial, everybody's on trial. Yeah. Right. You know, I learned things about my family that I probably would have never known if Ryan didn't do this. You know, so we just we just really stay to ourselves about it. We don't really talk to people about it. You know, people know, but I mean, what can you do? I mean, we had nothing to do with it. You right, know, we exactly. were brought into it. You know what I mean? So I, I I guess if that's your family member, I'm just speaking from how I think I would feel. Even though the situation was horrible, I would think that the love you have for your family member wouldn't change because that's no, still not your at all. brother. That's not, still not at your all. mother and father's son. Yeah. So, well, it's disheartening for the people who were devastated by it and who yeah. had their lives lost. But I, I would guess on your behalf, it's like you really don't want to talk about anything negative or look at your brother in a negative light, even though you understand because you're human and you have common sense. That's still your brother. Right. And that's right. unconditional love, I right. would still think. Yeah, right. yeah. So let's go back to childhood a little bit. Um, Let's let's talk a little bit about you guys' childhood. How was you guys' upbringing and, um, as far as the neighborhoods you grew up in and 
You know, how were you guys raised? Was it a normal home? Was it projects? Was, was it Atlanta? Or no, it was here? Baltimore. Baltimore. Oh, we, okay. we grew up privileged. You know, it's not a lot of talk about black privilege, but we were privileged. You know, we didn't, our lights never went off. Christmas was crazy. You know, food always served. You know, we had, we got what we wanted and more. You know, we could have went to any college we wanted to. You know, it's, it was, we had a good childhood. We had a fun childhood, but we were bad as hell. You know, so. th- we, <laughs> our parents didn't know the things that we were doing. We let them see the All-American, you know, we playing baseball and football, whatever season it is with the sports that, that's out as far as professional. Mm-hmm. And we're doing that. But when the lights go off and down in that basement, my mother thought she was the Kool-Aid lady, but we had 64 ounces of private stock down there. And we were smoking, you know, right. but they didn't know about this. Right. And we were just doing all kinds of crazy stuff just because we felt like it. It was never anybody to say, no, this wasn't a good idea. But fortunately, we never got caught. So it wasn't the parents' upbringing. It wasn't your parents' upbringing. Nah, they, they, they did the best. Yeah, they did. I mean, and they couldn't have done any better. Mm, right. You know, it right. was just us. Like so, a lot of kids. Yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah, yeah, like right. so, right. right. so you just do what you want when the yeah, parents aren't around. Yeah, just, so, so did you feel you influenced your younger brother I was to a, the negative, or do you feel like he just had that path for himself? No, I was a terrible influence. You know, I was one of the top DJs in the city at that time, and it was all about me. You know, I didn't care about what... I never got a chance to see him in a, one of his karate matches, in which I wish, wish I would have been able to see him. You know, I really wasn't into what he was doing. I was just mm-hmm. into what I was doing, and he was following in my steps. But he didn't want to stay in my steps. That's why he started working on his body and became really an expert in karate. Right. right. So that also helped in the situation for him to be able to subdue some people and do some of the things that... Kind no, of I mean, like not. I mean, they shouldn't have had that little grandmother carry... I mean, what could she do? Right. You know what I mean? You can't do anything with Brian. I mean, you were, she was too little and too old. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah. that was totally their fault. They should have had more people around them, especially since they had warnings coming in from people calling saying Brian was going to do something and them finding the shanks in his shoes. You know, but you're still going to put this little old lady That's in crazy. jeopardy. And the bad thing about this is she's still mildly retarded. Now, uh, let me find She's messed up. She's messed up. Special she has, needs. Yeah, she's special needs. There we go. Special she's special needs, needs the and they fired her. She don't even have insurance to take. She can't drive. Wait a minute. You said the lady who... who the sheriff who he... She was. She had she special was needs at the time no, she was... No, she out. has special needs now. now. Okay. So you're right. saying they fired her They after fired the her. She after, they, For some reason, I don't know what it is, she got fired. And when she got fired, she doesn't have any insurance to take care of her. Her damages that were done to her, mm-hmm. and she still suffers through today. Wow, so, and you it's know. so sad because I can't remember. Recently, I was having a conversation with someone. This recently, as in like a few days ago, and I said it's sad mm. that so many people are not proactive. They wait until a tragedy happens, mm-hmm. and then they want to everybody jump in there and try to fix it. But you really, if you just pay attention, and like you said, some things are common sense. But it, a lot of times it takes a tragedy to happen for people to say, oh, we need to do this or we shouldn't do this. But you have the people who are supposed to be so smart and in charge that should know these things before they happen. People really have to get but more you know proactive. What? I, I got an article that we pulled out the paper last week. Mm-hmm. The chief of police in Atlanta just passed away. And they had a nerve in his obituary to mention Brian. Why would you in his obituary? Why would you even mention Brian's name in his obituary? And they were trying to say that he didn't. They were still mad because he was vacationing in Cancun or something. And when this thing happened with Brian, he didn't come back. This this man just passed away. Why are y'all even putting Brian's name with this? You know what I'm saying? So I'm like, why y'all? A family member that wrote that obituary. I I, I don't know who did it. I mean, I've got a copy of it, but I, I couldn't believe that they did that. Yeah, your brother, your, the case, when I read the book, I learned that that case was one of the most, if not the most expensive, expensive case right, yeah. in the history of Georgia. They, they broke the public defender's bank. Yeah, because you know? I saw on the clip that they postponed the case for several months based on finances. Yeah, they couldn't yeah, defend they did. the case. Like There's still some right. people that haven't gotten paid from it. More than that, Atlanta. Remember the Atlanta guy that was with the children? Remember it was a big case in Atlanta with the gentleman? Wayne Williams. 
So it was larger than that. It was, yeah, it was, yeah. more money on it was the biggest manhunt in Georgia's history. At that time, when he got his sentencing, it, there was no one else in the whole prison system that had more time than him. So it was like, but it is now, but you know, it was like the biggest, and he's like the most notorious inmate that they have, you know, but you couldn't tell it when, if he calls, cause he's so calm, you know, mm -hmm. but he really just snapped. But the white boy in uh, Savannah, they trying to figure out what happened to him mentally. They taking him to Burger King after they yeah, arrest right him. After yeah, that, you know that was saying? amazing. Uh, what's, what's, I mean, I'm gonna tell you. You talking about the one that was in South Carolina? Yeah, yeah. yeah. South I'm gonna tell you something. Oh, yeah, yeah South that, Carolina. I, I'm yeah. gonna tell you something about that case that I don't think people paid attention to. This young man that murdered these people in that church mm -hmm. came out when they handcuffed him before they took him to Burger King. I don't know if you paid attention. But they put a vest on him. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. right. So that was for protection so that no one else could murder this young man. Mm -hmm. They protected him. him. Mm -hmm. And then I see us go out and, and commit light like crimes. Him. And we get choked to death and shot to death in the middle of the street. So, again, I'm yeah. not justifying any homicidal murder. I'm not saying that it's not a horrific situation. But I think that we should weigh things out. And the conditioning of... Uh, where we coming from with the mindset because a lot of times we fall to a hopeless situation and I've read the book mm -hmm. so I do understand Mark I won't give it away but I've read the book and I can promise you that if that situation happened to an average person then it would cause you to have some mental issue as far as what happened to uh, Bryant I'm not excusing again what happened but I'm telling you that's something that I'm aware of in that book that would drive the average man um, pretty well much I think it might drive a woman crazy too yeah, it's a tough situation, yeah, and um, I know you really you're not ready to book. elaborate it, but when you get the book, make sure you guys get a copy mm -hmm. of the book. Again, it's not to glorify the situation. It's to bring you back and show you from childhood up to now how things uh, uh, went on and what occurred with the, with these two young young men's lives. So do you have any other, si other siblings besides? No, it's, it's just me and Brian. That's my only brother. And I was kind of surprised when I heard you earlier say that people were wondering why you would bring me on here. I mean, it's... I I wouldn't have never write a book about what he did. You right. know, there's no right. reason to write a book about what happened. Everybody knows what happened. I'd only touch on that and briefly in a, maybe a chapter. You right. know, it's all about things that were happening in my family at the time, you know, right. and what we were going through, you right. know. So it's I there's no way this book is glorifying I, I, I say it several times. Brian knows what he did is wrong. I even right. say it in the book. This book is not about glorifying what he did or making him some kind of hero. And it kind of trips me out that, you know, it's a lot of people in Atlanta that Brian is a hero. They've had rap songs come out about him and dances come out about him. That's you know, true. people want me to true. get the book and get it to Brian so he can sign it, which he can never do and send it back out. But it's, it's, this book is not about that at all. Yeah, you know. and, and so I say that repeatedly because, like I say, a lot of people are misguided and jaded in their thinking, in my opinion. And I feel that they feel like anything that gives a platform to it is something that we glorify or something that we stamp. We all know that it was horrendous, but we also know that it's a lot more to this story, and we also mm -hmm. know it's bad on both sides. Yes. So as you, as you grew up and you guys were getting into it, um, when did you see a change in Brian, or did you see it coming at all? Did you see any changes, or you were just too busy caught up in Mark? I saw the change when he got into football. You know, he became more aggressive. You know, he started using his body like it was a weapon. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he would build his body like it was a weapon. I mean, I couldn't believe the weights that he was pushing, you know. His attitude really changed during them times, and I think it's because of uh, steroid use. Yeah. You know, steroid okay. use, yeah, his attitude. We so all, you know he was taking yeah, steroids? We, yeah, yeah, we know he was taking steroids, but he had stopped taking them after a while because he noticed that he was just getting a little too aggressive. Mm -hmm. So I noticed in the book as well, you said uh, that he was, e not evil, but he was like ups like angry. Not, that's what it, you said he was angry more often than not. Yeah, do you, you know why? You, why do you think Brian was so angry growing up? White people. He had an issue. Yeah, he really didn't, you know. So we it's had, something that we, happened to him? I mean, it's, we lived in front of Memorial Stadium. Um, we lived two blocks down from Memorial Stadium. And um, when the, the folks come out the games, they would come down there loud, peeing on our front lawns and, you know, acting like, you know, they could do whatever they want. And I think it started from there, him seeing how they were acting, you know. Mm -hmm. 
real disrespectful. So I really think it all began from, you know, from 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 that. Yeah. And you also mentioned the water. So for the water situation, let's clear that up because a lot of things happen. And you guys, again, you have to get the book because there's a lot going on in this book. But you said that you guys live down from like a treatment plant. Yeah, it's a water filtration plant. It um, it's at the top of the, at the top of a hill. We're like in a valley. Mm-hmm. You know, we were in a valley. Like thirty, when you cross Thirty Third Street, it goes up, and when you go across Thirty Fifth Street, it goes up. And at the top of Thirty Fifth Street, it's a water filtration plant. Mm-hmm. And so we, I kind of think that we were getting the strongest doses. I don't know how they do the chemicals in the water. I don't know if it filters out once it starts spreading out. Mm -hmm. But a lot of people have gotten cancer, gone crazy, you know, died for no reason. Yeah, you told me people were babbling. Babbling, yeah. I mean, just, I mean, like two two people. One person started babbling, and after a few months of that, he jumped off the back of the train and killed himself. And he was on his way to be a professional baseball player. Wow. Right, so then something's triggering the Something mind. is going on. You know, my best friend who was in the book, he didn't smoke, didn't drink, anything. Mm. He just died from cancer at 30-something. For what? You yeah. know, from what? And you spoke of a 13-year-old. Um, 11, I think he was 11. 11. He blew his head off with a shotgun. Why would you do that? So all of these are people in your neighborhood. In my, I mean, I, if you read this book, and it's people that I'm still learning about, that have killed killed theirself or killed somebody, and all of this happened in this little section of a maybe a four block radius. Mm, wow, yeah, that, that's that, crazy. Yeah, that's that's wild. Me, uh, that's why I brought the mm-hmm. water situation up. When you first came on, you mentioned the water, right. so I wanted people to understand why you mentioned mm-hmm. the water because it it seems to have merit at this point. Not to excuse again, but it seems to have merit because these it's a lot more tragedy in this young man's neighborhood. He's not. We don't even have time. It doesn't permit. Mm-hmm. But when I say a lot of tra- tragedies happen in that two, one or two block radius, I mean a lot of killing, a lot of being killed, a lot of just, like you say, babbling, people just losing Sickness. their minds, people dying of cancer, not warned. And so, you know, we believe that something was going on because I know that this is not something just the average person just goes into. Like it has right. to be something that drove mm-hmm. it. Something. To, uh, imbalance, what they would call a chemical imbalance or something to that effect. Wow. So for those, this is a question that I definitely wanted to ask. If you had a, if you had a chance to advise your brother prior to the situation, if he called you on the phone and said, Mark, man, I can't take it, and woo, 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 what advice would you have given your brother, if any? What, what would you have said to him to maybe I would have told him, man, look, if you didn't do it, just be relaxed. If you didn't go do it, God is going to get you out of this thing. You know, mm-hmm. just you got to relax, man. Don't do nothing crazy. You know, I done try to keep him calm. Right. But, you know, I I couldn't, I wasn't communicating with him during that time. Right. Okay. So How one, old was he at that time? Wow. About 35. 35. Maybe, in, anywhere between 30 and 35, yeah. Can we ask, Mark, about the young lady? He had the nine-year relationship. What is What was her state after the fact, like, Okay, well, I know I'm taking him to court for this, but this is not what I signed up for. This is not what I wanted to happen. Really? I don't really like talking about her too tough because, right. you know, she... That's a, that's a yeah, tough spot. That's, yeah, you know, that's I'm, when I was in Georgia, I just came back from Georgia, and I didn't even like going in that, that area, you know. Oh she yeah. she really... You've been together nine years. I know that's no is no. Time. You know, I know no is no, but... Did you really have to go through all, all of this? You know, I mean, four people are dead now. Yeah. You know, you're still living. He didn't kill you. You know, like, you could have worked it out or something. You know what I mean? Is nine years, y'all been having sex for nine years. Oh, so they were together at yeah, the time together. that this happened? They yes. Were, right. They were that's that's the that's they the, were that's the they were on the outs book. though they were they were together but a little on the outs you know she was trying to break it off and Brian was mm-hmm. trying to keep it on keep it right. together you know so I just feel as though man it could have she could have taken a different direction but I do understand that no is no and you know if that's how you wanted to do that's it the which mother of his child no no okay. that's not and that that was I think one of the reasons why she. Um, that it took it that far because, gotcha. you know, he cheated on her and got somebody else pregnant. 
You know, they say a woman scorn, you know. Yeah, yeah that yeah, is. Yeah, yes. I can testify to that <laughs> one right there. Mm-hmm. Got yeah. you. So, yeah, definitely that. And so, uh, Dana, you want to uh, wrap up with a few of those questions? Oh, well, I mean, we talk, We actually touched on a lot of it. I'm, yeah, we did. So, I, I just, I, yeah. I'm really, I'm kind of like lost for words. Because, <laughs> right, exactly. I mean, I'm kind of, I'm compassionate for the people that it happened to, mm-hmm. but I have compassion sitting right beside him because, like he said in the beginning, it's not his fault. And right. I know you probably have talked about this so many times, and it's right. your brother. I know you get to the point where, like, can we just move on? But I just want to say thank you for even coming. To yeah, just I, pre- talk I appreciate to us. y'all and, having me. Um, yeah, yeah. I, your book, the book, you guys need to definitely get it. And it's way bigger than just the tragedy the that people were talking about. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's right. way bigger than that. Yeah, these gentlemen actually had a life I'm um, prior to. And so uh, before we go, if you could see Brian prior to this incident, um, let's, let's X out the incident today. It didn't happen. Where do you see him today? Where would you see Brian today? What would he be doing? Well, you know, he was making, he was a, a, an engineer at Hewlett Packard. Brian was making some money. You know, he was living real comfortable. You know, he would be chilling, you know. So this, this wasn't some destitute young man nah, that's nah, strung uh-uh. out on drugs nope. and just a heroin addict and just crazy and just mm-hmm. doing... This was a young man who actually had a life. Right, exactly, exactly. And so this is engineer. He was an engineer, so he went to college? He went to college. He was playing football in college. Yeah, see, these are the stories we haven't heard. Mm. Like We don't know that. You know, these this is the side why I want people to get the book. Not only for Brian, for Mark as well, he also has a story to tell. And he's not just telling a story about his brother. He's telling a story about their lives. Like, so you guys, if you could, you want to tell them where they could pick up a copy of your book? You, if you go to Amazon and type my name in, Mark Nichols, uh, the book will come up. It's the Nichols Brothers, Suburbia to Destruction. I'm five stars on Amazon right now. Wow. And I also have the soft copies. If you hit me up on my Facebook, the Nichols Brothers, and I can get you one shipped out to you. Got you. So I, right. I'm looking forward to my copy. Right. Hint, hint. And so, um, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but no, I have it. Actually, I have it on Kim. You can download it as well, correct? Yes, you can. You can download it. on. It's an, it's an e-book form. Got you. So if they go on Amazon, then they'll see where to download the yes. e-book. Yes. As yeah. soon as you type my name in, the first one that comes up on that list will be my book. You'll see this picture here. And it's about 200 plus pages. Am I correct? It's about 284, I think. I believe it's 284. Yeah, but it's an easy read. Um, I noticed how you go back and forth a little bit in the book, but then I was able to capture what you were doing because I saw how you would say, hold on to that, and then yeah. you would bring that character mm-hmm. back into play later right. on during the book. And so you had some crazy friends, by the way. Oh, we was all, <laughs> man, we was nuts, man. Were we were nuts, I mean, for no reason. But it was fun. I know the you know. feeling. I remember growing up, I had both sides. I grew up in Baltimore part-time before I came back on the DMV Did side. you say part-time? Yeah, part I was young. <laughs> and so I remember having crazy experiences. I remember us hopping the train. Remember the trains used to come 4th of July? We used to hop on in and take the uh, fireworks off the train. And, and I remember my friend hanging off by his pants, almost got his leg cut off. So, I mean, it was, those are the things that we called fun. And until that, wild, that wreck was put in that neighborhood, we had no fun. We had nothing to do. So I'm assuming... Based on where I know you guys were, it wasn't no wrecks around the way. Man, it no, wasn't none of that at that time. No, it and actually, so we just got in trouble. Actually, it was. We that had we had wrecks. So the basket had we had basketball courts, football fields, the Lake Montebello. We had all of that. We just wanted to do other stuff. Boys right. just you being know? bad. Yeah, boys. we were just being bad for no reason. <laughs> Being boys. Yeah. That's it. That's so, it. Boys. Yeah. On that note, I'm a, before we go to it, I'm a, we got to wrap it up. But I just want to say for everybody who has those thoughts, I know some people are in tough situations right today. And you're contemplating like, you know what? I can't take this. I'm going to do whoop, whoop, whoop. Think. Always yes. say this. The juice has to be worth the squeeze. <laughs> the juice got has it. to be worth the squeeze. In other words, it's consequences to everything. And it doesn't mean that in our right state we're going to make the right consequences, the right decisions. I'm sorry. So if you stop for a minute, breathe a little bit, take it in, and just think, Mm -hmm. then it just might save you a lifetime in prison. It might just save you from someone else's life being taken. And I don't know how much it's worth taking a person's life. It's tough. But when you're not in the right state, it can happen. And so that's why I would advise everyone out there that's listening to just sit back for a minute, breathe easy, think about your decisions before you do it. Make sure the juice is worth the squeeze. And on that note, uh, before we wrap it up, give your information. Anything that you want to tell about Mark Nichols, where they can find you, where they can contact you, your Facebook, your 
Twitter, your whatever yeah. you have. Okay, I, you, I can be contacted on uh, Instagram at the Nichols Brothers. Um, on Twitter, it's Mark underscore Nichols underscore. My Facebook is the Nichols Brothers. And if you need to email me, you can email email me at the Nichols Brothers at yahoo.com. And I can get a book to you. Let me play devil's advocate real quick, piggybacking on what you just said, Stan. I think it's another thing that's important for people to know. Oh, we have to wrap it up. Okay, real quick. I think you have to, you always have to make sure that you don't play with people's emotions because people snap. So sometimes when you're being reckless on your end, think twice. Think right. twice because it's really, consequences. Because, yeah, you got to know that. Snap. Exactly. And so on that note, you guys, thank you, Lyric. Thank you, Dana. Thank you, Guest Mark, for coming on. We, we love you guys. Mark. Thanks for all the viewership. We had a great guys. show. Thanks for tuning in. And on that note, love hard, live good. Spotlight over the city. God we'll be back first. Next week. Spotlight. Spotlight. Spotlight over the city. I put the spotlight on your city. I put the spotlight on your city. See those superstars. Superstars. Hollywood to Hollywood. Girl, you look good. Yeah, they hollering, baby. A key modeling, baby. ATLD. I put the spotlight on your city.